Sleepy dog. How you doing, sleepy dog? Cha, how you doing? You want to go to Madison? Well, good day, my friends. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion. How are you all doing today? We're making our way towards Madison, Wisconsin, and I'm going to show you a real mecca of music today. A place that you wouldn't know from looking at from the outside the amazing history it contained inside. Days with Jordan the Lion begins now. So we've made it to Madison, Wisconsin, and you know, we just recently lost Steve Albini, the great producer of Nirvana's In Utero, and it got me thinking about, you know, how important a producer really is to a record, to a song. Uh, you know, it's almost the unofficial member of the band. Um, they have a hand in making the final sound that you will know forever for that song. And that's why a lot of bands will re-record songs they're not happy with the way it was produced sometimes they love it and that makes the song sometimes bands show up to record albums and don't even have their songs ready or finished and so in that case the producer is vital and so butch vig was the man of the 90s butch vig a lot of people knew about him from fanzines because he was recording a lot of punk bands and well in madison a lot of all bands he was running his own really low <laughs> low cost studio just trying to get by just for the love of music and it was billy corgan of the smashing pumpkins and kurt cobain of nirvana who found out about him and kind of put him on the map so we're actually at where he recorded a lot of those famous bands including garbage who pretty much ran their entire operation out of this studio we are at smart studios the former smart studios so this building on the corner right here was what became smart studios now it started out with two friends who went to university of wisconsin here in madison it was a man named steve marker and of course butch vig and they were friends from basically <laughs> they were drinking buddies who loved music and when the bar would close down they would go home and get smart as what they would call and they would go record together. Now Butch Vig had played piano since he was a little kid and then when he was about in fifth grade he switched over to drums and would you know listen to all kinds of music. His mom was very musical. She would basically was like a wedding singer and he ended up making money throughout his uh, college days playing in a polka band. He would make $200 in cash playing in a polka band and had a job at a hospital and ended up getting fired for taking his scrubs home. So when he got fired, he walked down to a music store, answered an ad for a band called Spooner, joined the band as the drummer and then liked their music so much, he's like, hey, we gotta start recording. So they started going all over Madison, recording their own music. And eventually it was Butch that said, you know what, I think I could do this for us. I think we can start getting the equipment. He said, I think I've learned enough in here that we can do it. And so he and Steven Marker, who was actually the roadie for Spooner, decided to put their money together and get a studio. It wasn't the studio, it wasn't Smart Studios that I just showed you. Originally, it was this one across the street. And they first started out in 1984. They were actually renting the second floor up here and they went and got egg carton liners glued them to the walls and before the paint was even drying they were having bands in here for twenty dollars an hour they would tell local bands anybody that you know fancied themselves a songwriter they would just say hey go get a real tape bring it here and it's 20 bucks an hour you can pay us later whenever you want and so originally that's where their recordings they would record all night record anybody they could just to keep this place going and then eventually the landlord told him that they had to leave. He said that they couldn't stay and they found out that right across the street was this building that nobody had been in for months and so they decided to move in here. Sorry about all the shade, I'm gonna give you the best views I can. Basically the building ends right over here on the side so here's the front entrance that you would see from the corner. So they started recording bands out of here and there was a local label, actually out of Chicago, called Touch and Go, and they had a band called Killdozer, and Killdozer recorded here with the great Butch Vig, and Butch 
said that they were a real sloppy band. Well, they were like a mucky, mushy band. They were uh, more of a hardcore band that uh, had a, the singer had a real low, growly voice. So Butch just decided to emphasize that. And for some reason, this band kind of took off. People started liking it. All these fanzines started writing about it. And that band, the Killdozer album, was actually how Billy Corgan and Kurt Cobain became acquainted with Butch Vig's work. Now look at this over here. There's nothing on the outside. I don't even, I think maybe somebody might live in there. Maybe it's a apartment building or something now, but here there's no official plaque or anything, but right down on this little labels, this has hi. Yes, this is the place you're looking for over at the studio. So Nirvana was an up and coming band and they had released their album Bleach on Sub Pop Records, which was a really well-known Washington based kind of punk alternative label. And they were coming through on tour and wanted to meet Butch and Butch agreed to record them. So it was April of 1990 for about five days. They came here and recorded a whole slew of songs. The songs are great. You can actually find them online. Just look up Nirvana smart sessions and recorded a bunch of songs. Fourth day that they were here, they decided they got a gig playing a, uh, an Italian restaurant called Bunkies. And um, there was like a downstairs area like underneath that could accommodate 100 fans. And they, were, they had a little bit of a following from Bleach and so they played a show there and Kurt put on such a dramatic performance that uh, Butch said he lost his voice. He actually lost his voice during the show and like the last three songs, they just kind of had to do his musical numbers. And then when they came in to record in here, the next day to continue and finish off their sessions, Kurt didn't have a voice left. So he said, well, okay, we'll just, uh, I'll just mix what we have. And you know, eventually you can come back here and we'll finish. And that was the plan was, uh, he mixed it, sent it to their record label. The record label gave a copy to Kurt and Chris, they, this was before Dave Grohl was in the band, it was Chad Channing was the drummer, and gave the record to, uh, to the band, and they took it upon themselves to go out and dub 100 copies, basically bootleg it themselves, and give it out to their friends. And uh, unfortunately, like, that was, the record label was paying for that, and they were intending on releasing the final product, but what ended up happening was Butch said, you know, weeks and weeks went by. He never got the call from them to come finish. And then he called and they said, well, we want to get him back in there in August, but now the band wants to sign with a major label and we don't really know what's going to happen. So Sonic Youth were signed to Geffen Records at that time and Thurston Moore gave one of the tape copies that he got from Kurt to Geffen and Geffen ended up signing Nirvana. Now the problem was Nirvana wanted Butch Vig to produce their album and Geffen said no, he wasn't established, they weren't gonna do it. And they told him, uh, this is coming from Billy Corgan, he said he was in the room when they called here. They called Butch and said, you know, we will approve for you to be a secondary producer in addition to someone else, but you cannot produce the record. And so he said, no, I'm not gonna do it. So that was basically what they thought was gonna be the end of it was that, uh, Butch Vig would not produce the record, and then he got a last minute call. Butch Vig said he got an 11th hour call, and it was the band saying, hey, we want you to produce the record. We've met with a bunch of other producers, and we just don't feel right about it. And we just, we're thinking about it, and we're like, we want Butch, and that's it. And we already have the studio booked. It was, they were gonna record it out in Los Angeles, and basically said, can you come here next week? And, you know, he said, well, can you send me some of the songs so I know what I'm working with? And so they sent him really quickly a demo tape they had recorded live of one of their practices. And that's the first time he heard Smells Like Teen Spirit, he said. And so when he flew out there and had a pre-production meeting with them, he told them to play something for him. And that's when he met Dave Grohl for the first time, who he would eventually end up working with in the Foo Fighters way later on down the line. But um, he said... He listened to them play that song and he was just like mind blown. He said, because when they sent the tape, when the drums and everything kicked in, he could tell it was bombastic, but it distorted out the recording so bad. And uh, now he actually heard what he was working with. And uh, he said that, you know, that was, that was what they ended up doing. They decided on the songs and he told Kurt, you know, I want you to re I want you to record the vocals 
doubled and Kurt didn't want to do that but he said hey John Lennon always did and he knew Kurt was a big fan of John Lennon so that's how they ended up getting Kurt to double his vocals and they ended up making what was to be sheep Nirvana sheep but uh, Geffen refused to allow that to be the the title from what I understand and they decided on Nevermind. But all of the demos that got them signed and what was to be that album were recorded right in here. They had two studios in here, Studio A, Studio B. And in 1990, the Smashing Pumpkins had been here. Originally, they were doing a single release, like an A-side, B-side for also the same record label Nirvana was on at the time. And they were going to record two songs here, Tristessa. So they recorded those songs and Butch found out that he and Billy were on the same page in every way. They thought about music the same way, they were the same type of perfectionist. So when Smashing Pumpkins got a deal with Caroline to do their first record, they came here to do it. This is where Gish, one of the greatest records of all time, sonically a masterpiece. I mean, even if you're not a Smashing Pumpkins fan, if you listen to the drums and everything, the way Butch brought all the sounds out, that was what he prided himself on. He's like, I wanna hear every instrument. I don't, even if it's a rock album, I don't want stuff to just be a mesh of sound. I want, it, I want you to hear every single thing. So once Nirvana's album came out, it was a huge success and everybody in the rock world, everybody in, the music world wanted to hire Butch Vig or wanted to come here and record. So a guy who was originally recording people for $20 an hour now had to up his price to $500 for a 12 hour day just to rent the studio space. And he was getting booked up by you know his favorite artist because once Gish came out and that was a success, Nirvana had Nevermind, that was a success. That was really the first major success because Nirvana ended up on the cover of magazines and they were an underground band that Smashing Pumpkins asked him to do Siamese Dream. Which was a huge deal and he said it was really, really high pressure, especially for Billy Corgan because he said Billy Corgan, they had a lot of expectations on him and the fact that they were working with Butch Vig, who just had a huge hit with Nirvana, it would be like, you know, you work with this guy and then you don't have a hit, it's even more embarrassing. So, I know that when Billy recorded here, when the whole band recorded here for Gish, he actually let the whole band record their parts, but then when James and Darcy left, he was just so meticulous about the sound he wanted that Billy himself insisted on re-recording the guitar part of James and Darcy's bass parts. And then when they did Siamese Dream, which they didn't record here, they ended up doing that in Atlanta. Um, they ended up, Billy basically did the same thing, would record most of the parts. And um, Butch, Fit, Butch Vig said that, you know, during that time, he was getting asked by so many people that he just, he literally couldn't work with all of them, including the Rolling Stones wanted to work with him and he couldn't do it because he had started working with his new project, Garbage, right inside here. I get to go in. Wow, this is someone's house now. This is so cool that she's nice enough to allow us to see. You can tell, <laughs> definitely it was a studio. And you said this where the mixing console and everything yeah, would have been. Studio A. Right there. The main, main space and there's Studio B upstairs as well. And then, yeah, so Nirvana probably would have recorded in there. Of course, uh, garbage. I mean, geez, this is so cool. Wow. And so all the posters on the wall are people who either recorded here or had stuff edited or mixed or mastered here. That is so cool. Now, were you a longtime fan or? I've become more since, uh, since buying. How could you not, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's so cool living in such a historic space that it, you probably just feel it all the time. Yeah, especially if you like throw on a record that was made here. Ah, uh, I mean, I just, I mean, I, I remember seeing, I saw Shirley Manson say when she came here the first time, she's like, you can just feel Kurt Cobain all over this yeah. place. So, wow. Do you do any recording yourself here? No. <laughs> wow. I'm surprised you haven't had people come in to ask or anything. So that's where the front door that we were looking at out front yeah, would have yeah. been. And you said you might turn this into kind of an Airbnb experience. Yeah, that's the plan. If you do, I will definitely come back. I would love to. Wow. Just to think the early version. At Killdozer, yeah. where it all came from, yeah. 
Wow, so cool to think of uh, Nirvana doing those early songs here. Yeah. And the album should have been done here. It really should have. It's just, yeah, you know, they... the one song made it on. Yeah, they just... Um, they, uh, I think they just had the space already recording. The recording space was already booked. Oh. And they were just trying to find the producer last minute. Yeah. Wow, this is so freaking cool. Wow, thank you for letting us see this. And they came to Madison. And of course it was Smart Studios, so let's get smart. That's what Butch said they, uh, they would yeah, say they when they were, were going to get drunk. Yeah, they'd be at the bar <laughs> and then And then she decorated it with all people that, you know, recorded mixed here. Freddie Johnson right there, like I said, from the Kingpin soundtrack. Oh, he's hey. my buddy now, yeah. Oh, is he? That's yeah, such a great song. <laughs> and then, of course, Smashing Pumpkins. At some point, you're going to get all these people coming back, knocking on your door, saying, can I come in and look yeah. around? I'm so-and-so from this band. And Funny, Butch, uh, I've met Butch a few times now. And he, him and his daughter were in town once, and she was like, oh, you should knock on the door. And so they took a selfie out front, and Butch was like, no, I don't want to just knock on the door. So when I met him, I was like, Butch, come inside. This you know, is so cool. So that's how you were able to know what was what, probably, just him walking around. And this was remodeled. Um, I know... Because Billy Corgan talks about it. He said originally when they moved in here, it was like just industrial carpet and white walls. And then when they made some money, had money coming in from Nirvana, yeah. they did a big renovation. And Billy said, I kind of felt like it took away what I loved. But, but Butch said it caused him to have to think about recording a different way. And that's how he came up with some of the sounds and the ways that he would get, get different uh, drum sounds and stuff when he had changed it. So this is the layout from the 90s remodel. And the fabric on the walls in there is still. Oh, you have the original fabric from the... It's just like... Yeah, oh, the that's the carpeting. Yeah. And there's like insulation and then two layers of drywall. And oh, yeah. Because I, I, the original one across the street, I know they did the, the eggshell lining yeah. and everything yeah. and then did it right over here. So, man... Here's the control room. Gosh, you can just... Everybody go listen to some great Butch Vig music today. That's all I gotta say. Here's some of their stationery. That, that was uh, something that came about, Billy said, after they did the renovation also. Marie Osmond L7. <laughs> see the upstairs. So this was Studio B up here. This is me. So this is more garbage than like most other stuff. Okay. Yeah, I know he said it was in both studios and they would basically take a year at a time, book out a year of their studio space at a time. This is a lounge before the studio, so while they were waiting for the rooms to free up, people would hang out here. Okay. Um, so yeah, Studio B then starts there, then it's a bedroom. Okay. And this is another like, guest room in here. And then an office through here. Wow. <laughs> so cool of you. Thank you so much. Wow, I had no intentions of bothering her or thinking we would get in there. And she actually saw me outside taking photos and invited me in. So, really nice lady. <laughs> she said that. You know, um, she still gets mail here, like fan mail for Shirley Manson. <laughs> and the place has been closed since 2010, so she has a good sense of humor about it. And um, yeah, very friendly. Butch found himself constantly being hired or people trying to hire him to do rock and roll records. And he loved rock and roll, he loved punk, he loved that stuff, but he wanted to do a little bit more. So he started working with the singer-songwriter Freddie Johnson, who I love the album they did together. It's called This Perfect World, and if you like the comedy classic Kingpin, it's in that movie. It's on the soundtrack, This Perfect World by Freddie Johnson. Amazing. And then after that, people started hiring Butch to do remixes of their songs, and that's really where the whole change and everything came about, where he got the idea for Garbage, because he said when they would mix records they would do like a remix for someone it was basically taking a finished song and remaking like rewriting a song out of it and through that he came up with all these sound manipulations and was enjoying it so much that he along with his singer from the band spooner duke erickson 
and his partner in this studio, Stephen Marker, the three of them started working on what would become Garbage. And they contacted Shirley Manson, who was already in a band called Angelfish, told her that they would like to meet her. Of course, she was in Scotland, so she said, when I come on tour, I'll meet you. And, uh, and that's what happened. They, the band Angelfish went on tour, took a couple of days off so that she could meet with Butch, and then when she heard the music, she said she was in, she had to do it. And inside this building for 10 years, they recorded five of the hit records of garbage, including the hit song Stupid Girl and all that stuff. So the, the studio was really successful for a really, really long time. It was basically in 2010 they closed it down because just the market had changed. People could afford recording equipment so much easier for their home. They, they were kind of seeing that instead of it being like, you know, fulfilling a local need, it was now, you know, there were so many studios, they just figured like the only way they could stay afloat was to change their format into like working in TV and movie production type stuff. And they just felt like the people that had grown with the business that worked with them all those years wouldn't be happy. And so they just decided to, uh, and smart studios here. So cool to see this. At least there's a little bit of something here. Just a little bit. Crazy to think of how many famous bands have recorded here from Sunvolt, Soul Asylum, Smashing Pumpkins, Nirvana, Garbage, The Dwarves, L7. Butch said when he was recording L7 here, he said they were a pretty lively bunch. He said it only took a couple of days before they had dealers showing up, knocking on the doors and all kinds of craziness going on here. But wow, look up, if you're interested in more, look up Smart Studios and look at for the recordings that were made here. And I think you'll be blown away. Basically from the middle eighties until 2010, a lot of people probably didn't even know what was going on here. This brick building just looks like a warehouse just sitting right here in Madison. What a history. Shirley Manson herself said the first time she came here, she was just blown away because she could feel Kurt Cobain's presence inside. Butch also said, you know, a lot of the reason that he couldn't work with all the people he would have loved to is just not enough time. He said, you don't know what's going to happen. He said he remembered when he agreed to do Siamese Dream with the Smashing Pumpkins, it was supposed to originally be a three month recording and it turned into six months. And then when they went to master and mix it, it was supposed to be three weeks and it turned into six weeks. He said during that time, Kurt Cobain was calling him going, hey, can you record Courtney's new record? She, her band Hole, she's got all these great songs. And he's just like, Kurt, I don't know when I'll have time because I don't know when this session's gonna end. And this has been so taxing that when I'm done, I'm gonna need like a couple of weeks break <laughs> just to collect my thoughts. So that's what he said basically happened a lot of the time. People would hit him up like the Rolling Stones and stuff and he, he would have loved to have been able to do something. He said even with the Stones, if he could have just done two songs to see what their chemistry was working together, it would have been great. But you know, he just couldn't do it all and he's still to this day making records with garbage, just not here any longer. I know it may just look like a stupid brick building, but if you love the 90s music and especially like grunge and alternative, Without this place, I mean, I, you know, cause you have to realize if Nirvana dubbed those tapes, probably a lot of what they were looking for when they were gonna do the Nevermind album was what they did here because they were listening to that tape so much that they had dubbed for their friends. That's the sound they were accustomed to hearing their song sound like. So Kurt would say later on, he thought that Nevermind was way too slick was not his style particularly, like what he would have liked it to sound like. But he didn't blame Butch for that. He actually blamed the guy who they brought in to mix it, Andy Wallace. He said he didn't really like the way Andy did it. Andy blamed himself. He said, by the time we got to that part of the process, I was just so burned out and over it that I just wasn't caring as much anymore. And I just, just didn't care. <laughs> but so many classic albums happened in there. It's just like, it's so cool for me to get to see this because it's not unthinkable to know that this building could be gone at some point, who knows when, but uh, piece of rock and roll history still standing here in Madison, Wisconsin, if you ever wanna check it out. Thank you all for watching. Go listen to Gish Siamese Dreams. 
Nirvana Nevermind, I mean, you name it, they, they were amazing, but if you go find the demos that Nirvana did here, the Smart Sessions, you can hear some really cool early versions of, it was called Emodium on there, but it was Breed, Poly, um, let's see, Lithium. He said Come As You Are wasn't on there. Um, they didn't have Smells Like Teen Spirit yet, but a lot of the songs that were on Nevermind were on there. So thank you all for watching. We'll see you next time. Have a great night and goodbye.